Will we still need masks in 2022? Biden opens his first migrant facility. And Coca-Cola wants its employees to be less white. That and more on this week's headlines. Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. Hey, have you been thinking, boy, I sure hope everyone gets to keep wearing masks for another year. If so, good news. In an interview on CNN, Dr. Anthony Fauci said it's possible Americans will still need to wear masks in 2022 to protect against the coronavirus. This is despite him agreeing with President Joe Biden that we will be approaching a degree of normality as we get into the fall and winter. It all depends on the number of COVID-19 cases around the country. Dr. Fauci said, if you see the levels coming down very low, I want it to keep going down to a baseline that's so low there is virtually no threat. It'll never be zero, but a minimal, minimal threat. So the official policy now is how low can you go? No wonder it feels like we're in permanent limbo. Speaking of being stuck in a never-ending purgatory, Syria. This week, President Biden took his first military action by ordering strikes on Syrian militias. Those militias are militant groups in Syria that are backed by Iran. So, congratulations, Mr. President. You know what they say. You're not really president until you've ordered your first airstrike in the Middle East. According to the Pentagon press secretary, these strikes were authorized in response to recent attacks against American and coalition personnel in Iraq and to ongoing threats to those personnel. He also said that the American retaliation was meant to punish the perpetrators of the rocket attack, but not to escalate hostilities with Iran. Yeah. Good luck with that. Let's go back to talking about something more cheerful, like the pandemic. Of course, one of the biggest challenges with the pandemic is how to reopen schools. Dr. Fauci seems optimistic. If you follow the guidelines, I think it will go a long way to be able to get the children back to school in the safest way as you possibly can. But San Francisco has come under fire for their plan to reopen schools because until recently, that plan was no plan at all. Instead, the local school board has been focused on its plan to rename 44 schools named after problematic people like Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. Yes, Abraham Lincoln. Okay, some Abraham Lincolns can be problematic, but this one? San Francisco Mayor London Breed supported the renaming of the schools, but she expressed frustration this week that renaming schools seemed to take priority over opening them. She said, what I cannot understand is why the school board is advancing a plan to have all these schools renamed by April when there isn't a plan to have our kids back in the classrooms by then. Our families are frustrated about a lack of a plan and they are especially frustrated with the fact that the discussion of these plans weren't even on the agenda for last night's school board meeting. Hey, calm down, Mayor Breed. Why would we even want our kids to go back to schools if they're still named after universally reviled monsters like Abraham Lincoln? If you're wondering why Lincoln was chosen, Teacher Jeremiah Jeffries says it's based on his treatment of First Nation peoples. Makes sense. And also explains why they're thinking of renaming the school to uh, John Wilkes Booth Did Nothing Wrong Elementary. But after a lot of pressure, the San Francisco School Board paused the renaming plan this week to focus on reopening. But honestly, we should just stop naming buildings after people, since people are never perfect. You know what always is perfect? Dessert. Let's just name everything after desserts. Who could get mad about Peach Cobbler Public Library? 
or find fault with banana pudding regional airport? How about chocolate milkshake national dog park? Actually giving chocolate to dogs is a bad idea. So maybe we should change it to vanilla milkshake national dog park. What's that, Shelley? Vanilla ice cream was racist. Is there anything good left in this world? One person who's not having trouble opening a facility for children during COVID is President Joe Biden. But not in the way anyone expected or wanted. I'll tell you more after the break. Welcome back. The first migrant facility for children at the border has opened under President Biden. U.S. Health and Human Services confirmed the first teens arrived at Carrizo Springs, Texas, which was converted two years ago into a holding facility under former President Donald Trump and had been closed since July 2019. Biden and the entire Democratic Party criticized Trump's use of holding facilities throughout the entire presidential race. In July 2019, Kamala Harris said that Trump has pushed policies that's been about putting babies in cages at the border. And she called it a human rights abuse being committed by the United States government. As you can imagine, Biden reopening one of Trump's migrant facilities raised some questions. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki defended the reopening, saying this is not kids being kept in cages. Saki said it's just a temporary reopening during COVID-19 and that the administration's intention is very much to close it. Hmm. Is there a but coming? I, I feel like there's a but coming. But we want to ensure that we can follow COVID protocols as unaccompanied minors come into the United States. The rationale is that they can't expel them because that would be inhumane and they need the extra room to facilitate social distancing. I get the sense that they're not going to be able to close this facility anytime soon. As a result, conservatives have been calling out Biden's hypocrisy on immigration. But to be fair, Saki is right that these aren't kids in cages. The Carrizo Springs holding facility doesn't have cages. Instead, it has bunk beds and classrooms just like it did under the Trump administration. That's because it's essentially a long-term shelter. The kids in cages photos from both 2018 under the Trump administration and 2014 under the Obama administration were taken at border processing facilities where kids stayed for a maximum of 72 hours before being transferred to places like Carrizo Springs. Still, the Biden administration's actions have been met with backlash within the Democratic Party. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wrote on Twitter, This is not okay. Never has been okay. Never will be okay, no matter the administration or party. But this kids in cages controversy shows that there really aren't easy answers to the illegal immigration problem. And the rhetoric is going to remain heated no matter who is in charge. I mean, migrant facility for children? kids in cages. It's like, you say tomato, I say concentration camp. Which makes it pretty awkward when I'm at the deli and order my grilled cheese with a side of concentration camp soup. But on the bright side, the San Francisco School Board can take notes on how to successfully open a facility for children during a pandemic while successfully renaming it. Another thing that Biden and Trump disagree on Genocide. Pressure is mounting for President Joe Biden to officially declare the treatment of Uyghur Muslims in China a genocide. The Trump administration had declared it a genocide shortly before he left office. Last August, the Biden campaign had also referred to it as a genocide. But as president, Joe Biden and his administration are now reviewing that label. Some people say Biden even defended China's genocide. But is that true? For a more in-depth look, watch our video on that from last week. But President Biden isn't the only North American leader hemming and hawing over whether to call it a genocide. This week, Canada's House of Commons voted to declare that China is definitely 
committing genocide against more than a million Uyghurs. The Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his cabinet abstained from the vote. For more on that, and on what genocide actually is, check out this episode on our channel, China Uncensored. Now, Trudeau said, when it comes to the application of the very specific word genocide, we simply need to ensure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed before a determination like that is made. How many dots and crosses do you need? If it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and puts ethnic minorities in labor camps like a duck, then what you've got there is a big old bowl of concentration camp soup. It isn't that difficult. This issue should be as black and white as Justin Trudeau's face at a costume party. More after the break. Welcome back. U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers in Cincinnati, Ohio, reported finding 20 kilograms of cocaine-coated cornflakes. They were being shipped from South America to Hong Kong, but were intercepted by a narcotics detection dog inspecting freight in Peru. The dog alerted authorities by saying, Cocaine bricks! The contraband was estimated to be worth $2.8 million and was likely the work of noted serial cocaine kingpin, El Chaco. When authorities put their ear to the cereal, they could hear it snap, crackle, and sweatily detail plans for a new business while rubbing its gums. Speaking of Coke, our next story is about Coca-Cola. What? You thought I was going to discuss a white substance that gives anyone who has it undeserved confidence? Well, I am. White privilege. Coca-Cola is allegedly trying to combat racial discrimination by promoting an online training seminar that urged employees to try to be less white. Slides from the seminar were shared online by an anonymous employee. The tips to be less white included be less arrogant, be less ignorant, and break with white solidarity. Other good tips to be less white include stop taking astrology so seriously, quit yelping inside of Ikeas, and realize that quoting Rick and Morty isn't a substitute for having a personality. Those last three weren't on the slides, but they're good to keep in mind. In a letter to Fox Business, Coca-Cola said the slides are not part of the company's learning curriculum and that they were part of a now-removed, publicly available training program on LinkedIn. The training program was attributed to Robin D'Angelo, the author of White Fragility. She claims it was attributed without her consent or knowledge and was based on clips she gave to the outlet Big Think in 2018, taken out of context. The whole situation is a bit muddled. But if Coca-Cola really does want its employees to be less white, then they should probably start by replacing their polar bears with grizzlies. After all, they're a lot less polarizing. So what do you think about the stories we covered? Leave your comments below. And remember, America Uncovered is supported mainly by viewers. Be sure to visit patreon.com slash America Uncovered. Contribute a dollar or more per episode. We rely on your support to help us keep making great episodes. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.